Hi, so welcome everybody to uh, On Being Black in Education. Um, I'm Mike and with me, I have some powerful folks and I'll let them introduce themselves um, because I hate butchering people's introduction and it's always awkward when I intro somebody and they're like, well, actually this is what I do. And so so, so um, I've been working in education for um, over 10 years. I work for the Reinvention Lab at Teach for America, build schools um, on the side. Um, I'm excited. My most recent project that I'm really excited, I'm on the board of directors for a school called the Freedom School of Arts and Entrepreneurship that we'll be launching in Dallas, Fort Worth um, with brother Kazna Ma'at Ra. And I'm really, really pumped about that. Uh, so you're hearing me talk about that a lot because it's going to be an all black, all boys school uh, where we do some crazy stuff um, in Fort Worth. Um, yeah. And so other than that, I'm just focused on reinventing learning. So who, who wants to re uh, introduce themselves next? Go, Danny. Okay, well, since I got thrown on, <laughs> um, <laughs> my name is Danielle Shelton, and I have been in education, ooh, 18, 19 years now, knocking, knocking on 20 years. So I have done uh, middle school, high school, college, um, and I'm also an instructional designer, and uh, I edit for Ballard Publishing Company. So I'm also freelance too. So freelance editor. And uh, I just launched this last year. Um, it is very new, but it caught on and I love it. Um, my podcast called Tip Centrics for online instructors. So uh, that's me in a nutshell. Love it. All right, let's do it. You up. All right, Liz, you're up. <laughs> My name is Liz, Liz Liber, Elizabeth Liber. Everyone calls me Liz. And I am also about a 20 year veteran of higher education. I taught for a short time in K through 12, but the majority of my time has been, spelt, has been spent in higher education. I started out as an admissions counselor. So I did that for probably almost a decade or so, seven years, something like that. And then transitioned into a faculty role. And I've been uh, full time and adjunct for the past uh, decade or so. I've taught at probably a dozen different colleges and universities, both online and face-to-face. -face. For the past uh, seven years or so, I've been an instructional designer. So I, I design online classes for a small career college here in Fort Lauderdale. And my newest venture has been my own online platform called Black History Culture Academy, where yeah. I have an asynchronous, asynchronous learning platform that I launched just about a month ago. I have 100 students uh, in the past 30 days, it's almost 30 days, 28 days or so, just in time for Black History Month, with small micro learning classes about African history and culture, African American history and culture, and also basic foundational diversity, equity, inclusion classes. That is awesome. And normally I forget something, but and I don't think you forgot, but I'm gonna I'm gonna mention that Liz is a LinkedIn top voice in education. So one of the top people to follow on LinkedIn on this platform that we're streaming live on in education. So make sure you follow that content because it's great. Um, I applaud that. I'm so excited about, about people teaching black and African history like in, in 2021. And I think that has a lot to do with like the reason why you started that and the reason why we're all here, right? Like it's, it's all very similar. So y'all, we're here to talk about the state of black education, right? Black being black in education. So I'm gonna I'm gonna ask y'all, like we've all worked in education for a while, right? So let's talk about education from the standpoint of the employee or 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 the 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 teacher. What's your experience been like being black in the classroom? Um, I can tell you for me, I grew up um going to an inner city school and then i went to a hbcu so i was surrounded by blackness um mm. when i graduated from school though um, my first teaching gig was at a dyslexic um and add institute i was the only black teacher um and then i switched and i moved to orlando and there i was teaching at um pretty much all white, all conservative. I was very, very uh, one of the few sprinkles of teachers um, at that school. And I learned so much about those kids and the culture and the lack thereof. I um, learned a lot about the way to speak. Um, and by to speak, I mean, I, I had to learn my 
I had to learn that things were threatening about me that I wasn't aware that were threatening, that are not threatening to black students. But because I didn't have that population of student, then I was catering to a population of students that were told a narrative about black people and about black women specifically. And I had to be aware of what the narrative was because I would get kind of blindsided with these um, ideas of intimidation. And I would say, wow, you really think that I'm intimidating? And then what they would tell me wouldn't match the what they, what they came up with. So yeah. it let me know, like, you know what? This is really the narrative that's being painted. And then I started doing, this is what I started doing. Um, I started doing poetry shops and I would only cover black authors. That's it. And I started opening up my classroom and opening up my students to black history, to poetry, to prose, um, because I'm an English teacher and it was not received well, uh -huh. but I did it anyway. Um, <laughs> so uh, that was kind of like my learning, my learning curve when it came down to like being black in education. And it really was a mirror to my face to be like, oh, this is what it is. Because before that, I was blind to like what other people saw because I grew up in, in blackness. So I didn't really get it until I was like out of it. And then I was like, oh, that's what this is. So I, I had no clue until I was right there. That's that's such an interesting yes. perspective because normally it's like reverse. Normally it's like I grew up being the only black kid in all my classes, but you grew up in blackness and then ended up in a white space. So Liz, what about you? I'm interested. I'm, I'm interested. I want to know. Very similar story in that Danny and I actually are from South Florida. I didn't know Danny until I became an adult, but we actually went to this similar demographic of our schools are rivals. So oh, they're wow. both in very predominantly black neighborhoods. And we're in South Florida in Broward County where we're surrounded by blackness. You know, you, you in certain places you can go and you can you hardly encounter uh, those in the dominant culture and you move amongst spaces where you are in the majority. So you don't really think about your colors being something that's threatening or a deficit or an issue. I mean, you know that you're in a poor neighborhood, so you know that that's a problem in a sense that you're not going to have the same um, opportunity or experience. And I think Danny's school probably did the same thing that my school did was they instilled in you a sense of, hey, we're going to empower you. And we, I took black history when I was in high school and they wow. wanted to uplift the students. And my, I remember having my teachers, they came to school in their kente cloth and they were like, giving you an African name. I remember I took African American history and I took a government class and they were like, you ain't Elizabeth. It was like the, the opposite of Roots. And like Roots was like, your name told me. They were like, get that book and pick an African name. And when you come Whoa. in the store, that's gonna be your name. And I picked Amina and that was gonna be, that was just my name. And that's what they, everyone called me in class. And he would call me and he'd be like, Amina, cause he knew what my name was based on the name that I had picked. So wow. you were talking about a whole different experience. And then I actually went to a PWI. So it was a culture shock of, wow, now I'm totally the opposite. I'm the minority on campus and no one's speaking life into me. Everyone's kind of like expecting me not to do well. And there's nobody to kind of support me or encourage me. I had like one black professor the whole time I was at my school as an undergrad. And I think as a college professor and working in education, I have returned to South Florida. So there is a sense of you don't feel um, necessarily displaced per se, because you are moving in most spaces where you do see, you know, folk in other um, cultures and, you know, South Florida is very cosmopolitan in terms of you have the Latino, you have the Caribbean, but you don't see enough black folk in leadership positions. You don't see enough mm. black folk that are advocating, even if they are in leadership positions, they're not necessarily mentoring other black folk into leadership positions. You don't necessarily see a push to make sure that the, 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 uh, the professors in the classroom are as representative as a student population because uh, when you're teaching at these career schools and some of the community colleges, a good portion of those students, maybe one third of them are students of color, black mm -hmm. and brown students. And then you don't necessarily see something intentional where they're like, okay, let's make sure that we're putting the resources into making sure the retention and graduation rates are there to support those students. I feel, feel like when you come from um, some of these inner city areas and, and, and marginalized areas where you have these communities, 
there isn't as much support to, to make sure these students are well prepared. And, and as when I looked at it, maybe from a macro level, looking back at it, I know that as a sector, education is not committed to. So even though I might not see it in my day to day when I'm going into a community college or if I'm going into right. a career school, maybe I see people from different races and ethnicities. But I know overall the the general state of the, the, the sector is not really other than adjuncts because adjuncts are actually very uh, predominantly um, those that are maybe black or brown. There's mm -hmm. not the amount of attention paid to how do we get black college presidents? How do we get, and I'm speaking just from a higher level perspective, but I think it applies, applies across the board that, you know, I think me and you had this conversation, Mike, about this, like you have these young black and brown children, but if all the, the teachers in K through 12 are predominantly middle-aged white women, how they relate to these children. And then why right. are black and brown children being suspended and expelled and criminalized? And I just saw a very yeah. disturbing video online of a, a young girl, high school, 15 year old getting slammed on the head by a school resource officer. Why are these things happening in K through 12? And then when you go to the college level, you don't have enough people in leadership positions to stand up and, and, and stand up against some of these issues in terms of lack of representation. If you have someone that's in a leadership position, maybe they can advocate. And I just don't feel that there's enough intentionality behind making sure that uh, our voices are being heard um, on that level. Yeah. That's so interesting. Now, when y'all say South Florida, just point of point of, or are y'all talking about Miami? Like, includes I, I, like Tri County okay. area. So, Tri -County, like yeah. Broward, Dade, and uh, Palm Beach County, and it's kind of like you see in 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 Dade, you see a lot more of the Latino um, and and black in uh, Broward, a lot more maybe Caribbean and and, and black, and then. Palm Beach. I, I currently live in Palm Beach, and that's a little bit more toward the the more dominant culture. But you still see a lot of black and brown folk. Mm -hmm. in, in, so South Florida, on a whole, is pretty diverse. Once you go outside of Florida, though, because both of us went to school in North Florida, it's definitely totally different. different. So it's yeah. almost like night and day. Right. I think as a as an educator, though, you want to see that you know there's there's an agenda that your needs are being met as a professional, and I just don't necessarily see that i've never had a mentor my whole time of being in education i've been in education 20 years and no one's ever come and said you know what are your career goals or how can i help you to attain those are you looking for leadership i think it's kind of like you're just kind of stuck out there and then whatever yeah. happens happens and i think yeah the only mentor i had was it i was in the fir a first year teacher program so when yeah. i was teaching k through 12 i went through the non-traditional route because i didn't have a, a teaching certificate because i graduated in a different um degree program so i had a mentor then but, and he was really good, actually. It was like a, a middle-aged white man. And he was just like, here's what you do. This is what you don't. This is, you know, the, the ins and outs of it. And like, literally, that was like as a 22, 23-year-old. And that's the only time I've ever had a mentor my whole professional wow. career. Yeah. Yeah, I've never had one either. You know, I I grew up in Texas. I grew up in Houston, which is not, it, it's very, very diverse. I mean, the weather is probably similar to South Florida. It's hot and humid all the time. Um, <laughs> you know, mosquitoes the size of your hand. Like, it's, uh, so. Yes. Yeah, so that part I feel like you know, I Houston is interesting because it's, it's one of the most diverse cities on the planet Earth, and you, you just kind of go to school with everybody. But I remember I, you you mentioned slam like watching that fifteen year old girl getting slammed by a resource yeah. officer, and I saw that in high school. So I I was in high school uh, when Hurricane Katrina hit, and I remember hearing the police officer say, uh, and it tripped me out because he was black. He was he was a police officer that was in our school every day. I remember him going, "Oh, these black kids are a different breed of black people," and I was like, "What you mean?" That's I was problematic. Like, I said, "Black folks don't come in different breeds. They like they got different style, but that's because they're from a different place." I was like, "What you talking about?" Like, um, and and that that was my first experience with like, like it, like real really like understanding because I grew up with the side eye to the school system and I grew up with um my you know my my father and his brothers in the nation of Islam. And mm -hmm. and if like we, we don't need to get into to, to the belief system but but I, I was taught that like whiteness is dangerous and, and whiteness is meant to harm you physically, emotionally, intellectually, almost in every way. And you have to figure out how to navigate the world so that it doesn't harm you. And when I, when I heard that police officer say that and I watched the white officers nod, I said, oh, that's the game. 
that's the system. That's what they've been talking about my whole life at the Thanksgiving table and at the dinner table. And I've been like, oh, I've been like nodding, but not understanding. And when I was a freshman in high school and I saw that, that's when I was like, oh, OK. And, and it changed my whole perspective on the education system. I wish that I had my, like my biggest regret is not going to an HBCU. Mine too. I tell yeah. Danny that all the time. Yeah. I think like, that Danny, tell him the stories of how the parents get mad at you when you're trying to encourage their kids to go to HBCU. Because I think <laughs> we're taught in the black community that you, you shouldn't go to HBCU, which is what I kind of thought. I was I went to a predominantly black high school. I need to learn how to navigate predominantly white spaces. And I also think sometimes, uh, you know, there's such an, an, an I've learned this as I've gone along and talking to different people that have gone to HBCUs and talking to leaders at, in some of these black uh, colleges and universities, how nurturing they are and how yeah. much they, they graduate. A lot of the professionals, nurses, doctors, engineers, pretty much any profession, most of them are coming from the HBCUs, but we, yep. that narrative is never really taught or told. So a lot of us almost feel like, well, if you go to HBCU, that's like a second choice. Like you want to go to PWI. Exactly. You know, an elite school would be number one. And then second would be maybe like a four year traditional. And then third would be maybe community college. And then way down the line, it's almost like, well, if I had to go to an HBCU, I would, but it wouldn't be a first choice, which is really sad because that may be the best choice for a lot of our students right. so they can get that nurturing and, and see the black role models. I, I talked to a college president. He said the sad thing about it is by the time a lot of students go to a PWI and even the ones that we see that come to grad school at our HBCU, he's like, they're exhausted. They're so yes. exhausted because they've been they're dealing tired. with microaggression and they've been trying to fight the system and they every minute they're dealing with double consciousness. Like, what is this person thinking? What right. are they saying? What am I doing? Am I acting right? Am I talking right? Do I look right? So he's like, by the time they come to grad school, it's almost like they can't even function in grad school because they're like totally tired, which I that's thought was exactly, really sad. That's exactly, you know, and yeah. that's the conversation that I want us to have. Like, like Daniel, you, you get got to get into this because I, a while ago, I posted about this and I had a lot of pushback, but I was <laughs> I asked the question. I was like, are we ready to talk about how people are counseling black children away from our university? Because no. I'll tell you, listen, Texas Southern University, they said they said, Mike, come do speech and debate at our school. And I remember having people. My mom graduated from TSU. And I remember having people tell me, no, don't go there. You don't want you don't want to go there. You don't want to go to pre PV. And I was like, no, nah, but this is where my family went to school. They were like, no, 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 you don't want to go there. So I go to Texas State University, which I don't regret. Love the school. But I'm tired. <laughs> to your point. So, Danielle, let's get into this. Like, tell me about these. Well, Danielle, went, Danielle went to FAMU, so you know she got all kind of pride. <laughs> I, okay. Florida a &M. Last, last thing before, I, before you go. I don't know of any other HBCU that has more pride than FAMU. Everybody I've ever met from fit like they ride for each other. They don't matter who you are, or what like Hampton, it's so, Howard. It, it's so sad that I went to University of Florida and we would be wanting to do the chat like fam you, <laughs> fam you, fam you. We would want to do the chat, but we're like, but we don't go there. <laughs> but why? <laughs> we would want to do that chat. So yeah. Like, go, go Gators. <laughs> yeah. Go Gators. Yeah. It, I can tell you as a as a senior teacher, right? I always get caught up in my students doing college applications and trying to get them and, you know, try to make sure that my, my students are doing what they need to do. Um, and it always comes down to where do you, where do you want to go? And I push HBCUs. I'm like, so let's look at Southern. Let's look at Prairie View. Let's look at Clark. Let's look at. And my students are like. I don't want to go to that school. And then sometimes it's such a, a hard thing because it, it breaks my heart sometimes. And then, of course, I push Florida A&M like now nah, before I'm like, Florida A&M, what are you studying? What are you going into? Um, because what I have to do to them is show them dollar for dollar, cent for cent. And what I show them is you can sit up here and go to a PWI and go to their nursing program. And when you graduate, be working at a totally different, be the librarian and be working at a totally different job than what you went into. Or you can go to an HBCU that get into that nursing program, do an internship, get the tutoring and the mentoring and the, the get the, the molding that you need and go straight from graduation into your career field. 
and they don't really get it sometimes. And I have talked some other students into going to HBCUs. And now I can say they love it. They love it. I get some emails like, hey, Miss Shelton, I'm so glad I came. Because I see um, there is something to be said about attending an HBCU. And let me say this, it comes at a cost. Me repping HBCUs comes at a cost. I do get angry parents. I get parents who are like, don't tell my child to go to an HBCU because they feel like it's a lesser education. And then sometimes I have to tell them, you know, look at Howard. And I had one mom like call me and say, like, how dare you tell my son to look at Howard or to look at Morehouse? How dare you? And they were so angry. And I was like, what are you angry about? So then I said, well, mom, what do you know about Howard? What do you know about Morehouse? Well, I can't tell you what I know, but what I can tell you is it's a black school and they don't get no jobs. And I was like, that's couldn't be further from the truth. So now let's look at some stuff. And I really had to educate mom because she was coming from a place of listening to a narrative that made her feel like going to an HBCU was going to get her child a lesser education. When what it really gets you is when I am on FAMU's campus, I have gotten a chance to interact with people that I never would have interacted with. I get to interact with activists. I get to interact with entertainers, with, with ball players, with politicians. And they're on campus with you. And you get to go to their seminars and you get to sit there face to face with these people. And you like it, it's such a, a weird experience and such a, a welcoming experience all at the same time. Because they, it is a very um, family environment. And I can tell you a story. I'm going to tell you a story. This is the difference. My friend went to the school across the street, across the tracks from Florida A&M. And she used to tell me like, oh, you know, we go to school in our pajamas and we go to school, you know, with our bonnet on our head. And I was like, what do you, what do you mean you go to school in your pajamas? I don't understand. She was like, oh, I just roll out of bed and go to school. And I was like, oh, okay, man. And I can remember a student literally rolling out of bed and coming to class. And my <laughs> instructor at that time, Dr. Hobbs, I will never forget her. She was like, where are you going? How dare you represent yourself in this way? And she read her to the skies and poor girl broke down. She cried. But every other time after that, when she came to class, she came to class prepared. And you know what? Let me say this, that helped her. It helped her learn how to show up for herself. You won't get that at a PWI. They don't care how you come into class. But at HBCU, the classes were small enough where she was like, uh, you, no ma'am, you will not represent yourself and represent this school and represent me as a black woman and come to school with your face not done in your pajamas and you have on bedroom slippers. Like, absolutely not. She completely went to like mother role. And I feel like that's sometimes what we need. Um, so I push HBCUs. I push educating students about HBCUs, but I also push educating parents about HBCUs because all I've really found is they don't know enough and they are afraid. Um, and the narrative that has been taught is if you go to an HBCU, you are going to get a lesser education. Which is totally, like we know it's totally untrue. Like I, I, don't, I don't have the stat but um, Liz talked about like doctors, lawyers, all that. I don't have that stat, but 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 we we know that's totally untrue. Yeah, yeah. yeah. From, from what I heard, it's like the majority because I've had a few HBCU presidents that have come on um, my my podcast that I do the Ed of Experience uh, the Ed of Experience where we interview a lot of like higher ed leaders. And one of the main things that a lot of them are who are coming from we've had from. Claflin College, from um, Xavier, um, just different colleges and universities, HBCUs all over the country, is just that pride they have in the idea that they're some of them top amount of nurses, top amount of engineers, top amount of doctors and law, any profession pretty much. And I think it's upwards of maybe 60 percent. And I, I, I like you, Mike, I'd have to grab the exact stat. But I think one of the things that really I've heard a couple of um 
uh, colleges and university presidents that are over HBCUs tell me is they speak life into their students. And I talked about yeah. on the first day of orientation at University of Florida, which I had a great experience there. And I, and I loved going to school there, but it was really hard. And I don't think it should have been as hard as it was considering the fact that I was coming from a marginalized background and I wanted to be in a more nurturing environment. And it just was not that. It was more of, well, hey, you're here, sink or swim. There was a minority um, intern uh, mentoring program that I went to one of the, I went to like the, the initial, like, hey, come to the mentoring program. And I never went back because it was super awkward. Like my mentor they paired me up with was like, a 60 year old older white man. And he was like, hi. And it was like super awkward. Ooh. It was like, no, I think it's old daddy's conversation. It's like, no conversation. I was just like, and he, call, and he called, and I know he probably tried because he called me and I was like avoiding his calls. So I was just like, I didn't feel that we would have anything to talk about. I'm like 17. I'm just like, I need someone that's going to be a little bit more like, well, me and Mike have talked about this too, this idea of being relatable. And if yeah. you can yeah. see it, you can be it. And I think for a lot of our black and brown students, if you're asked them to relate to a middle-aged white person, it's nothing negative against the person. It's like, if you want to talk to somebody that they, you feel like they've walked in your shoes, they understand your struggle, they yeah. can guide you because they can be like, well, if you have this situation, you know, act this way or talk this way or do, do this, or this is how you can give you some tips and tricks of how to, you know, just to go back to tips and tricks, right? Like, how do you overcome some of these uh, situations? If you have someone that you know has never been in that situation, then how can they properly navigate? And when you're on the first day of campus at orientation, they don't think about the fact that you're coming from a marginalized background. You've been right. disparaged your whole life. Every, everything around you tells you can't be successful. And it's like, look left, look right. Neither of those students will be there at graduation. It's like, you're already like, okay, so this is the setup. <laughs> right. I'm literally not going to graduate. <laughs> my mom was horrified. My mom was like, did you hear that? I was like, oh, I guess I have to study really right. hard. You know? And then when you talk to the college HBCU presidents, they're like, no, we speak life. We're like, look left, look right. Those are, you know, make sure that the, both right. those people, are you're your brother's keeper. And their yeah. whole intent is to, we talked to a college president and he was like, I have like five mentees. They have my phone number. I'm like, the college <laughs> president is mentoring the students because he's like, they're going to pass. That's I'm right. going to make sure. He's like, I, I let everyone have my email address. If you have a problem, you email me. And you just don't see that at a PWI Maybe they're out there and I'm not going to say every single PWI is like that, but my experience was I was just a number. I was lost in the shuffle. I didn't feel like my needs were being accounted for. You do have your little pockets of community. So if you're in Black Student Union or, you know, you're in whatever little clique or crowd that you're able to get some support on that measure, more on a community mm -hmm. level with the other students. But mm -hmm. from the top down, as far as getting support from the faculty or from an administration or something that's an initiative to make sure that you're in an inclusive environment where you do feel like you're supported, I just don't think that that would be the case. And it's really discouraging. And then you wonder why students, just the retention rates are just not there. The graduation yes. rates are just not there. So it definitely speaks, I think, to the idea of at a, a FAMU or some of these other HBCUs, they do focus on nurturing the student. I had a college president, it just came on like maybe last week and he was like, uh, I forget, it's a Latin phrase and it's like in, in absentee parentis. And he was like, that means in absence of the parent. So yeah, he's yes. like, when they drop the kid off, we become their parent. We're go and if you if you said that at a PWI, they'd be like, "I'm not your parent. <laughs> if you, you didn't come here for that. Like, you better go home if you're looking for a parent because that's not our job." I, I mean, our professors just straight up tell us like, "This is a weed out class." So basically, my job is to make sure that if you're not strong enough for this nursing major or engine, I'm here to weed you out because you cannot. Wow. This is a gatekeeper class. You cannot get into your meeting. They tell you that the first day, so you're like, okay, I got to study. Because oh, you're already discouraged. Yeah. You're already discouraged on the first day because they'll let you know, like, 50% of the people do pa do don't pass this class. So if you if you want to pass this class, you're gonna have to work because if it's up to me, you're probably gonna get an F. <laughs> so yeah. you're just literally stuck. And you're like, oh my god, like I'm probably not gonna pass. Like I better be stuck. And that's why you would find a lot of us would be in the library pulling all nighters and just scare and then that mental toll that that takes on you i think when i graduated i was just like super exhausted and i was supposed to be i was a journalism major i was supposed to go work for the newspaper in my in fort lauderdale the sun sentinel because i had been an intern there um during high school and college and i just was like too i was like too overwhelmed i decided not yeah. to even go into 
um, writing and as a profession. And I just went into teaching and then I did nonprofit work and higher education. I haven't really written professionally until this past year, like yeah. as a writer and being published other than when I was in high school and college, just because the imposter syndrome was so hard because wow. in, in journalism school, they were like, you probably ain't going to get no job. <laughs> it's really competitive. That's it's crazy. Hard. Cause and I thought I, I had a silver, the, basically the red carpet rolled out for me to actually get, because I was in a minority internship program. Wow. So a lot of people don't really know my story because people always like, you're such a good writer. But I really did not feel I was a good writer. I actually felt like I sucked. <laughs> that yeah. was in my head. Like, even though I had, was in the minority internship program, everyone was trying to nurture me to be a writer. When you go to a college where constantly all day, all you hear is, and I mean, a lot of it is just a dominant culture telling you the reality. It's just like, you know, being an actor or being a ball player it's like being a writer is a tough gig but when you already yeah. have that idea that you're probably not gonna be successful because your background tells you you're not gonna be successful it's really difficult so i think we have to think about the narratives when i my first day of class you know what i tell my students you if it has if it's up to me you're gonna get an a it's like oprah you get an a you get an yeah. a you get an a because i'm not here to give you an f like if you work for it i'm not gonna say i'm gonna give it to you but just to be you know just to be funny to them to let them know if it's up to me, I'm not going to be a gatekeeper to stop you from getting A. I want you to be successful. And I think that's the problem that a lot of the those that are coming from different backgrounds, they don't really understand why it's so important to speak about positivity and uplifting these black and brown children because they don't really understand just how that negative narrative comes into play uh, as far as your yeah. success and how you think about yourself, you know? Yeah. You know what? Like, I'm so glad we're having this part of the conversation. And I'll tell you how I know this is good. Because I've gotten four DMs from on Twitter and two on LinkedIn from racist people telling me that, that we should we should not. They mad. They big mad. They like, mad. Like, <laughs> That's like, how you know you're doing good when you yeah. start getting trolled. Like yeah. I, I got people, we've had people trying to throw hate in the comments. I don't know oh, if y'all seen. I but, saw, but I'm just like so, that's how you know it's getting real spicy. Right. They get real so, mad. But I'm I'm getting DMs real from people. Like I got one from a guy who says I can't believe LinkedIn is allowing this. I was like, Oh, what are you gonna okay. do? How dare <laughs> LinkedIn allow black people to talk about blackness and black education? How dare LinkedIn? Right. So as a matter of fact, like he's gonna be real mad when he finds out what LinkedIn is about to do in February for Black History Month, and when he finds out that LinkedIn is really supporting black voices. So I just wanna um, LinkedIn promoting up. black voices. though. So he's gonna be real mad now. Right. Wait till wait till you hear about what we've been. <laughs> talking about with LinkedIn behind the scene like I'm just I'm just so I'm happy that the hate is coming out because that's how we know we're doing a good job so yeah. thank y'all for, for triggering your story <laughs> the tr yep. triggered. The triggers. <laughs> but you know what? I'm gonna tell you I have taken hate and turned hate around because when I lived in Texas I had students at the very beginning that was like I don't want this teacher I don't want like they no. were so negative and so like just what? Want, did not want to have me at all and was like how dare this school give me this black in instructor and oh, by, the end, by the end those same students came up to me and said I am absolutely happy that I had you and I have not met a black woman that's been educated thank you for showing me that at least one of you exists and I'm like oh it's still racist, but it's it's a, it's it's, it's <laughs> in the right direction. <laughs> it's progress. still racist, but yeah. at least you realize that we are educated, <laughs> right? Like, but it's it's like you know, growing up. But in it Texas, shows in how people are not exposed to no. black folks, yep. and that's why we need to have these conversations. They need to see the reality exactly. of what's happening because they have a narrative in their head of what it means to be black. And a lot of that is coming from the media. A lot of it's coming from social media, TikTok, wherever they're getting their information from, they're not getting it from the stats and they're not getting it from the reality of what's happening. Black women are like one of the most educated demographics in the country. So to yes. say that black folk are not educated or black folk don't want this or black folk don't want that or black folk are not that, I cannot stand those kinds of narratives because it does not give people a true picture of the right. black experience. And that's right. what's the problem. And that's why you have people that are storming the Capitol and doing all these things because they have this narrative in their head that is just a total fantasy. And it's like, right. it's, these conversations have to be had so that we can straighten it out because clearly somebody's not being taught correctly if they think that yeah. they couldn't have a black teacher or the black, a black woman couldn't be educated enough to teach a class. Like where would exactly. they get that idea from? Yeah, right. he immediately, and he told me like, I thought you were like beneath me. Like, what could I learn from you? And I was like, oh, okay. All right, oh, then. Wow. 
I've well, let me, take, let me take my master's in English and put it in my, put it in my pocket. Yeah, like, I, I, like, I've been there. Like, I've had parents that sit down with me, and the first thing they say is, oh, what, what experience do you have teaching this subject? And I, I, I say, oh, yeah, I've got plenty, but let's talk about you. Like, like how, what's your background? I had a parent most recently. I designed a public speaking program for a school. And his parents sat down with me, and this was a very successful person, so I'm not going to say his name. Um, but his parent asked me, parents said, like, have you ever done public speaking before? I said, oh, yeah, a little bit, a little bit. And he's like, well, do you have samples? I said, yeah, go to YouTube and search my name and then put TED Talk after it. There's two of them that you'll find. <laughs> and, and all of a sudden, like, it was a different conversation, you know. You um, had to prove yourself. Your, get your yeah. receipts for them with your TED Talks so they the know receipts. it's real. <laughs> so they know Keep it's real. <laughs> Right. Like keep the receipt. And, and to some extent, like it, it hurts to say it, but my, the first Ted talk that I did, like I did it as a receipt. Like I was really careful about the YouTube video. Like I wanted that because I knew that I, as, as, as an educator, I was tired uh, of a, as a black educator in a white space. I was really tired of having to prove myself over and over and over again. So now like, you know, and we can talk about this as well, but like the reason why I really suggest that especially black teachers build a personal brand because yes. like, like the stuff that you, that's, that's your running receipt, right? Yes. Like the, the brand that y'all are building on LinkedIn and on, 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 online, nobody can say anything, right? No, no, nobody can say, Oh, well, Liz, you don't know how to write. Oh, no nope. <laughs> features. Right. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? Right? Like no, your track record is speaking for, for itself. You know? Um, <laughs> Right, you know, and, and I'll, t I'll tell you this one, one thing going back to, you know, college experiences and, and, and just thinking about the collection of educators. I, I said this and it was not well received recently, but at a, at a PWI, it takes an abnormal experience for a black student to have an identity affirming experience at a PWI. So I went to a university called Texas State University in San Marcos, Texas, small. Well, it's a, it's, it's, it was 30 plus people, 30 plus, 30,000 plus students when I was there. But there was this group of black faculty members that just said, you know what? We're going to wrap our arms around every single black kid. Mm -hmm. I'm telling you, I didn't know anything about college. And a man named Earl Mosley looked at me during orientation. He said, you look lost. That means you probably are lost. And I was like, yeah. He said, OK, where are you supposed to be staying? I said, I don't know. I don't think I have a dorm assignment yet. He was like. OK, what about your financial aid? I said, I, I don't think I have that set up yet. And he was like, all right, come with me. Took me into another woman's office named Miss Lawson. And she made two phone calls. And they were like, OK, you're in this dorm. And it was the best one on campus. They were like, your financial aid is set up. And then they just person after person, Terrence Parker, right? Like, like Vincent Morton, these black people came out and wrapped their arms around. But had it not been for them, I don't, well, number one, I don't know how I've graduated. <laughs> number two, right? So the, the, the point is that no matter where you are in education, black people need black people, right? Yeah. And and Dave L is really upset about that on LinkedIn. But that's, so, that's okay. <laughs> but yeah. isn't, isn't it okay to need other people? Like it's it okay. No, we're not supposed to, to say that. We can't but have it's community. Okay that's not allowed. People, <laughs> like I'm gonna tell you guys this, and Liz has heard me tell this story before. I had a student when I taught middle school, she was she was challenging okay. to every single teacher. And every teacher was like, get this kid. What is going on with her? We don't understand. The only person she listened to was me. So she would get kicked out of class and guess where everybody would send her? Yep. <laughs> to me. Guess why she was going to me? Because I had an Afro. And she uh, had an Afro and I was the only teacher that had an Afro. And she was like, I love you so much. You're my favorite teacher because your hair looks like mine. Hmm. Wow. Like what? And isn't that okay? Isn't that yeah. okay for her to feel like she's connected to me because we look alike. And the one thing, like I'm teaching her. And because I'm teaching her, she looks at me through a certain light and through a certain lens. She's not looking at me as a peer. She's looking at me as a parental figure sometimes, as a, as a guardian sometimes. And when she said to me, I love you because you look like me, your hair looks like mine, that lets me know, like, 
our kids need to see us so that they can see themselves and that's okay and for people to be angry because our kids need to see us and our kids need to see themselves and we need to see us we need to see you know the uh, keisha lance bottoms and we need we need to see that and that's okay but it makes people so angry for us to have examples and point out examples but why, like, you're not angry at mainstream examples, and we get fed mainstream examples every day, all day long, 24-7, anytime you turn on TV, anytime you go in the store, anytime you walk down the street, anytime you look at an ad, the minute you turn on the radio, it is everywhere you go. So now you want to be angry because right. I'm giving an example, and I'm helping this little black girl, a little black boy, and I'm inspiring, and I am also being inspired you're angry by that that lets me know that your anger has nothing to do with me and everything to do with your own self maybe you don't have somebody that mentors you and maybe that's why you're mad like right. it's, it's to me when people have such hate in their hearts hate is such an internal thing that it really just makes me say there's something wrong with you like, it's not what we're talking about. It's not the subject matter. It's not about Black people. It's not about any of that. It's not that you're angry with, with the three of us. You're really mad about something that has absolutely nothing to do with us. And let's deal with that issue. Liz know how I get sometimes. I'll be like, let's, <laughs> that sounds good, but let's deal with the real issue. Right. The real issue isn't LinkedIn. It's not that it's on this. It's not that we're Black. That's not the issue. So let's deal with the issue. You know, let, let, Oh, she don't yeah. <laughs> but that's really what it boils down to. I was just talking earlier. Somebody said Tony Morrison said it. I mean, amazing writer and and just amazing role model and civil rights activist. And when you think about it, she, she when she had an interview with Charlie Rose, she said, "Take me out of it." I think sometimes people need to look in the mirror. When we're talking about these issues, we're talking about systemic issues that need to be addressed. So we're talking amongst each other and talking about our experience. But at the end of the day, those that are in the mainstream, those that are in the dominant culture, when we think about systemically, and Mike and I have had these conversations as well as you and I, Danny, about how we try to be a role model in our community. I think Mike was the one, yeah. and I keep repeating this now, if you could see it, you can be it. So our yeah. role is to work in our sphere of influence. I'm, I'm really yeah. big on that. I like to be people stay in their lane and then do what you can. Because I think sometimes people feel like in order to make change, you have to be marching and or you have to be doing, you know, you have to be Keisha Lance Bottoms. Not everybody is, or not everybody is Stacey Abrams. Not everybody is Kamala Harris. Everyone has their area where they excel. And we have voices like a Toni Morrison, or you have an activist like an Angela Davis, or you have a political figure like a Keisha Lance Bottoms or a Stacey Abrams. So our voices are that we're able to do, Mike able to do a TED talk or be able to start these schools and, and work with these startups and, and look at how to reimagine education. Danny and I have been able to, and I think Mike talks about the whole idea of branding. We've been able to mobilize that and use our voice yeah. to, to show people there's different ways to look at things. And then they, you have an audience that you're able to influence and maybe think people will take that back to their school district or maybe people will try to influence or maybe they'll help with hiring, whatever the case may be. I think that people have to get out of this idea of that they can't be effective. But I think also get out of the idea that you know it's up to black folk to carry the whole burden. I think as a country, mm. education really needs to tighten up. You know, K through 12, as well as higher education, really need to do better. And we can speak up definitely, but I think there's definitely a lot of room for those that are in the positions of power. Those are at the top levels of the positions of power. If we're talking about changing education systemically to look at where are we deficient. And I think COVID has been a huge wake up call mm -hmm. for everybody where it's like, okay, we need to really take a look at what's happening in these school districts. We need to take a look at the state level. We need to look at the federal level and how can we as a country reckon with the idea that there are so many inequities? There is the the, uh, the digital divide. There is inequity of funding. There needs to be more teachers, black and brown teachers in the classroom so that those teachers yeah. can, they, hey, the demographic of student is about to really shift. So yes, those people that are big mad on LinkedIn, you about to be even bigger mad when you're in the nursing home because black and brown children about to be fit. So whoever feeding you that applesauce, but those are people about to be 50% of the population. So don't go to the nursing home then because that's about to be your nurse. That's about to be a doctor because these youngsters that's coming up now, 
those children, those black and brown children, are about to be 50% of the population. Black and brown folk are about to be the majority. And yep. I know people don't want to hear that, but that's the census bureau's talking. Bureau yep. talking. That's what we're talking. That's so right. youngsters that we're trying to nurture right now, we got to treat them properly. We got to give them the resources. We got to help them because these children, these black and brown children are about to be the next leaders of this country, the next leaders of our society, the next leaders of the next generation. And if we're kind of like, oh, we don't have to really put the resources or their parents need to read to them at night and don't, don't come to us about it, just figure it out on your own. We're about to be in a world of hurt in about 15 years when all of us are older and you know we're in a nursing home. What, what, direction is the country going in if we're not putting the adequate resources into these young black and brown children. I think Dr. Um, Varek, who's the president of Xavier University, another amazing HBCU, yep. I was so impressed by him. And one of the things he said was that we could, we could identify Chinese children, we could identify Indian children, so we could look at somebody that doesn't even come from a country with running water, somebody that's walking around and they're sloshing around their feet in a, in a ditch because they don't even have proper sewage system, and we could see the potential in that child and bring that child over here and train that child to be an engineer, train that, train that child to code, train that, train that young person to go on and, and dominate Silicon Valley. Yep. There's young folk right in our own neighborhood, and when he said that, I was like, it was like a mic drop moment. It's a good thing the camera wasn't on because we had audio only. Yeah. And I was like, whoa, that yeah. is so true. How is yeah. it that we're nurturing Indian children? Not to say that we shouldn't. We should. Okay, that's fine. But why the child is walking along the, the street here with a backpack on their back, that child going to get racially profiled. And then yeah. somebody can be calling and saying what that child doing there walking along the street. But a child is coming from a third world or developing, I should say, developing country we are pouring into those children, but there's black and brown children and we'll deny them lunch and give them a peanut butter and jelly sandwich because they got a, a, a balance for lunch. Exactly. We'll yep. pour money into a child that comes from another country and say that that child could be the next STEM engineer. That's, yeah. that's not right. Yeah. And, you know, and I, I think the other part of the, the, issue, the, the issue is that, just like you're saying, we, we're, we're restricting the careers of black children. Um, and real quick, I just want to shout out uh, Dr. Chris Medina who literally brought back the great debaters. If you ever saw that movie, uh, he, he went to coach at Wiley College, uh, I think from 2011 to 2018. He's in the comments on LinkedIn and just dropped a great comment about fragility. Uh, Dr. Medina is, is doing phenomenal work, is now at Prairie View A&M, so is creating a career um, and is raising up real black leaders, some, some of my peers from, from speech and debate. Um, but yeah, I think one of the things that we're not willing to to do for black children is consider everything on the table. I had a discussion recently where uh, someone said, "Oh, like we don't, we don't need any any more LeBron James. We need we need more Mark Zuckerbergs." And I was like, "Do you actually know that a kid, a seven year old kid, their chance of making the NBA is actually much greater than being Mark Zuckerberg? Do you know what it takes to be Mark Zuckerberg? Right? Like you. Don't, I, and so I'm I'm actually." coming to this place of balance um, for black children, which is literally like whatever you want to do, the only thing that stands in between you and that thing is work. So if you say, I want to go to the league, and I've had players that came to me and said, look, I want to go to the league. And I'm like, all right, well, here's here's our practice schedule now. And they go, oh, 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 uh, that's what it takes? And I was like, I don't know. I ain't been there. But I think this is what it takes, given what, what, what I've talked to. And, and they're like, uh you know, maybe I think I want to do something else. And I'm like, okay. And I've had people that went through the program and I've seen, you know, players go play at university D1 schools and, and, and not make the league and come back and coach in my program. You're like, I, I've also helped students learn to code. Right. I think, I think that's the, the interesting thing about being black. I think Tori wrote this in a book uh, that you caught a lot of heat for some reason, who's afraid of post-blackness? Where he basically said, if you black, anything you do is black. Skateboarding, surfing, mm. basketball, science, math, whatever wow. you do, it's black. It's put, put black in front of it. That's it, right? Wow. Um, yeah, and so I, I, I like the careers that we're funneling mm. black children into, I, I, I think we need to pump the brakes on that, right? So um, investing in black children, I think means giving us options. But that, that goes back to what we're talking about is to give to, to have options you need resources and you need as much resources as the next child has so so i mean I, i'm just i'm just so excited i'm so thankful that we got to have this conversation it's it's yeah. almost been an hour can you believe it 
<laughs> it doesn't seem like it's been an hour. It seems like it's been like five minutes because we've just been chopping it up so hard. But it's, the I conversations know. need to be had because that's yeah. how we kind of get those creative ideas flowing about how we can make a difference. Yeah. We all are so dedicated to the idea of improving education. So it's awesome yeah. to have these conversations. They're yeah. always like so fun. Yeah, yeah. And so I want people to connect with y'all. I want people to connect with us and, and continue yeah. the conversation. Um, so if you want to find um, Danielle or Liz, where can they find y'all? Well, you can find me on LinkedIn. I am there. You can also find me on Instagram with uh, at Lit Works for You. Um, I am also on. So that's my IG name, Lit Works for You. Or you can find me on Instagram, Danielle Shelton. Send me a connect. Let's connect. And I'm also on uh, LinkedIn. So you just look for my name, Elizabeth. Liba, and you can look me up and send me a connect request or follow me on LinkedIn. I'm on IG and Twitter with the handle. Everybody keeps laughing when I say this now, maybe because Coming to America is coming back out, but my handle on LinkedIn, uh, on IG and Twitter is your queen to be. So it's oh. you are <laughs> queen, T O B E. So you're queen to be. So you can find me on there, tweet or post on my IG. And then also uh, my Black History Culture Academy. That's where you can find my program. So go to www.blackhistoryculturalacademy.com for 20 plus. I have 20 classes that are active, 20 that are coming soon. So I'm rolling those out over the next few weeks. And my goal is to have 100 classes in the platform by the end of the year. So you oh, can, nice. uh, yeah, it's subscription style. It all you, it's like a buffet. So uh, it's unlimited access to all the courses. And as, as I continue to roll courses out, it'll continue to increase in value. So check that out as well. I'm so I'm about to be on there. I'm so excited about that. Like you have no idea. And especially because like on my podcast, we talked about um, I talked with Jeffrey Henderson, who's the founder of 99 products, the guy that created the easy brand. And he he literally said the word school should be a buffet. Like school should be on demand buffet. Yeah. So that's yes. it. Like check yes. that out. Um, y'all know y'all can find me. Yeah. <laughs> y'all know y'all can find me on LinkedIn. And basically, like I'm just gonna say it. The three of us gonna have to get back together and get on here um, again and do this uh, some other time because this was awesome. This is amazing, and I, I, I cannot thank y'all enough for lending your powerful voice. Thank you. Thank you for having us. Ooh, this is awesome. Um, thank you. Yeah. All right.